man kindly asked me to, to make a talk of Welfrin, and I said, I'm not sure whether it's possible, but it was a very intense adventure, and I'm very proud to be able to share it with you. Thank you. Sicily, as we learned from the diary of Heinrich Welfrin, was a destination he had dreamt of for a long time. In his diary of May 11, uh, 1911, we read, quote, a more favorable development can hardly be imagined. Munich, Basel, Berlin, Munich. The great journeys that are still to be made, Constantinople, Orient, Brown Italy, Sicily, France, medieval Paris, the modern Paris. Then, 10 years later, the gene came too. In July 1921, Heinrich Rolflin was longing for a winter vacation. In his letter of July 6, he writes to Anna Bühler Koller, a Swiss friend, quote, I am worn out, repeat myself. The machine runs mechanically on, urgently needed once again to take up quietly to think and without the daily interruption of having to speak at a certain hour about a certain topic." End of the quote. Barely two months later, the vacation plans took concrete form and Welfrin talks about the journey to Naples and Sicily. From his summer retreat in Silva Plana, he writes to Josef Gantner, that he intends to undertake this journey in the late fall of the year in company of a younger artist or an art historian. He writes, I have thought of you for the latter case and would like to know right now whether you, if the matter comes about, would be available for such an expedition. Think it over. Buy a Kodak if you don't already have one and read Homer to prepare. Different stages of this journey are well known. On Wednesday, December 28th, Walflin is in Genova. On January 2nd in Naples, Josef Kantner, who had written his doctorate on the Walflin, was his adlatus during this journey. He had to inspect the cabins of the ship, Città Siracusa, which brought them to Palermo. After encountering certain difficult difficulties in the form of a taxi strike in Naples, the situation did not improve in Palermo. We read, the streets are narrow, dark and muddy, the procession of a deceased channel blocks movement for half an hour. Salvation, the wide street along the sea. The next day was hardly better. He writes, afternoon useless concerning a view of Gesù di Maria, Chiesa, the church of Gesù di Maria, you have the picture here. The day is wasted. One felt a shame in front of the excellent monk who led us up through the churchyard into the poor church and used a slightly heated sacristy as a waiting room, offered until the rain was over. Through walls along the lemon gardens, we went back. Balfelin's enthusiasm for Palermo only arose the next day when he visited the Cappella Palatina, the Palatine Chapel, where he attended the ceremony of Epiphany. His enthusiasm is palpable when he writes, Cappella Palatina, great ceremony with lightning, how the brilliant dressed cannon sits on the stage. In contrast to the dark crowd below, 
all the attention is focused on them. They are incensed by the deacon. deacon. The deacon embraces each one. Artificial lightning makes the mosaics even more effective. The Christ in the apse must also be brought out in this way. Here you have an inside of this uh, Palatine Chapel. Uh, it's a painting of 1840. In the foreground, you see the people who are attending the celebration. In the middle ground, you see the canons, uh, even uh, with uh, the chanji, I will explain later. And in the background, you see the apse with the altar. At this point, our questions begin to set in. Had he, Ralphlin, prepared himself for the visit to the Capella Palatina? Is he appropriate literature? And if so, which one? During his presence in the Palatine Chapel, did he correctly decode the scenes unfolding before his eyes? Was it possible for him to penetrate the historical dimension of the Capella Palatina and the liturgy taking place there? What was the key experience during his visit? Is it possible to deduce from this short passage his method of analysis and in particular, his art historical method? I come to chapter two. Let us begin with a question concerning the literature Ralphine consulted preparing during or during his winter trip to Sicily. First, he brought with him a copy of Goethe's Italian journey, which took place from 1786 to 1788. It's this book, it's from this book that he had picked up the idea of the necessity of reading Homer while visiting Sicily. We know that the second book he brought along was indeed Homer, Odyssey, which he had recommended to Joseph Gantner. But what strange idea to choose as travel guide for Sicily Homer's Odyssey. We can state at this point that this Greek epoic poem dating from the eighth to the seventh century had become by the mid sixth century part of the Greek literary canon. Homer's Trinatia was effectively identified by ancient authors with Sicily, but this had never been proved. Goethe himself saw his Sicily more on the land of the Filiations, named by Homer too, sitting in the public garden in Palermo, situated on the seashore Goethe writes, I quote, but the impression of that wondrous garden remained too deep for me. The blackish waves on the northern horizon, the strange uh, struggle towards the bonds of the bays, even the own smell of the steaming sea, all this called the island of the, of the blessed Fatsikians, to my mind as well as to my memory. I hasted at once to buy a Homer to read that song with great edification. This quote shows that Goethe's Italian journey was a problematic travel guide as well as the Odyssey by Homer. Balfour stated himself, quote, read Goethe's Italian journey I have to consider how much he leaves out. The inequality of the mentions is remarkable. Not a word about Monreale or the Capella Palatina. This lack of information concerning the hotspots of Palermo 
can find its explanation in the fact that Goethe was interested particularly in antiques and collections of antiquities. So visiting the Benedict Abbey of San Martino, adjacent to the Cathedral of Monreale, you can see it on this uh, postcard. He reports, I quote Goethe, the monks let us see their collections of antiquities and natural things. They preserved many a beautiful thing. We were particularly struck by a medal with the image of a young goddess, which aroused delight. Afterwards, Goethe and his double companion had uh, lunch in the abbeys, as he tells us. Oh. After the dessert had been served, the abbot came in, accompanied by his oldest monk, sat down with us and stayed for a half an hour, during which time, we had to answer a number of questions. And going to the Palazzo Reale, Goethe notes, you see the answer, went into the palace where the busy guide showed us the rooms and their contents. To our great dismay, the room in which the antiquities are otherwise exhibited in the greatest degree because a new architectural decoration was in work. The statues have been removed from their places, covered with clothes. Scaffolding had been set up, so that despite all the goodwill of our guide, we could only acquire a very incomplete idea of them." End of the quote. These two quotes show us that in Monreale, as well as in the royal palace, Goethe had it for the collections of antiquities. In this perspective, the Palatine Chapel, as well as the cathedral in Monreale, were in some kind out of his view. At this point, we can ask whether Wolfling had other literature than Homer and Goethe for his journey to Sicily? Probably not, as he had a deep aversion against tourist guided by the Baedeker. When the art historian was in Rome in March in 1887, he noted in his diary, quote, I make the journey without much, much preparation. I take a bit of historical knowledge with me, but very little. I want to rely completely on myself and try to recognize what is important without using the glassing from so and so many books. I hope my adjustment is formed so far. A good sketchbook, a piece of paper, these are my companions. End of the quote. As we see, 25 years later, Welfrin made a compromise taking with him Homer's Odyssey and the Italian journey by Goethe. What we have in mind is a remark on Jakob Burkhardt's answer to the question, which was the best book he would recommend for a journey to Italy? Burkhardt's answer was, as we may guess, Goethe's Italian journey. And Ralph Lynn to comment, quote, we today hardly understand his verdict anymore. One is so eager to point out what Goethe has not seen in Italy that one forgets the positive aspects of his utterances. And he continues, the whole aspect of Italy has changed for us. We are looking for something different than Goethe and we see what he was looking for with different eyes. Would the Baedeker travel guide had given Wolfling a more accurate description of the Palatina, uh, of the Palatine Chapel. 
In a way, yes, as it contains a resume of the interior, bringing it back to Roger II, also pointing out the uh, original parts of the mosaics and the door. To complete the, uh, the possible travel guides or travel literature, travel work, we can say two, we can name Joseph Victor Wittmann and his Sicilian and andere Gegenden in Italian. However, this guidebook was shown to him when staying in, in a hostel in Guicenti and was therefore not included in his luggage. Let us go back to Walfrin's comment on Goethe and the Cappella Palatina. As we have seen, Goethe didn't take notice of it. So the question arises, did Walfrin better? Reading Walfrin's passage again, we have doubts. Cappella Palatina, great ceremony with lightning, how the brilliantly dressed canon sits on the raised stage in contrast to the large, dark crowd below. All the attention is focused on them. They are incensed by the, incensed by the deacon, the deacon embracing each one. Artificial lightning makes the mosaics even more effective. The Christ in the Acts must also be brought out in this way. The analyst shows us, Walflin is not really describing the chapel. Of the four lines, yes, you can see the four lines or in inscription here five, there's only one which describes the chapel. The other lines are devoted to the canons and even in describing them, he did not seize the historical dimension of their status. Here, another view of the interior of the chapel, which you see the axis with the Christ. And we have a picture of canons in a general way. Let us shortly present the College of the Canonici, an institution which we find not only in the Cappella Palatina, the Palatine Cap Chapel, but also in other places. One year after his ascension to the throne on December 25th, 1130, King Roger II founded the Royal Chapel and in 1132 established the College of Canons. Within the hierarchy of the church, the Palatine chapels belong to the Archdiocese of Palermo with its Archbishop. At the time of Roger II, the Archbishop was Peter, Petrus and the Bolla Archivesco Pietro was written in the day of the incarnation of the Lord in 1132. I would like to have shown a Bolla but we can discuss this perhaps afterwards. It was very hard to get information from Palermo. It was under Peter II that the Cappella Palatina got the status of a parish church. To the institution of a collegiate belongs the college, church, and the canon. Collegiate indicates a church of certain importance with a college and the chapter of canons. Its aim is to give a divine worship more solemnity. Furthermore, according to the tradition of the Catholic Church, the collegiate church can be simple or distinguished. It generally retains the title of collegiate, even in the case that the chapter of canon ceases. The institution, innovation, or suppression of the collegiate chapters are received uh, or reserved to the Holy Seat. The term collegiate or collegiate chapter designs a community of canons. The community life of this college is defined and specified by the rule of Aachen, which was formulated in 816 which assigned to the canons a share 
of the capital goods. A load individual property, thus determining the exemption from the law of poverty and establish the practice of the vita communis. During the Middle Ages, the common capital goods were divided into individual prebends and community life was abolished. Consulting the founding document helps us to understand the organization of the Palatine Chapel. The different persons involved are listed at the end of the document. In the first place, we find Peter, the archbishop, under him, the archdeacon, Henry Cospamer. His position is defined as cleric, having a defined administrative authority delegated to him by the bishop in the whole or part of the diocese. Then comes the cantor, or chantro, cantore, primicerio, by his name, Johannes, followed by the 12th canon, a presbyter, a name without qualification, Fulcus, who could be the scribe as well as the subscribe. And finally, in the last place of the range is the name of Guarinus, Capellanus Cancellarius, the major capellan of the king. Nevertheless, his position was important. The canon and the clergy of the chapel were exempt from jurisdiction of the ordinary and had as their superior the march chaplain of the king who exercised jurisdiction. However, Vince Capella Palatina was only at the beginning of, the, of his construction in 1132 when the canons were installed, it can be assumed that the services took place in the so-called lower church, also uh, basically called crypta. On April 28, 1140, the royal chapel was consecrated. It was only around 1140, with the completion of the Palatine Chapel, that services also could be held there. So you see, have another insight. You see one of the canons just in the foreground. You see the slightly elevated estrade where the other uh, canons are sitting, the so called uh, canon choir, and then in the background, the apsis with the Maria. Here you have a, a plan of this uh, Palatine Chapel dating from 1754. And just, uh, uh, I cannot, yeah. Uh, you can see uh, at B, noted at B, the choir of the canons with the seats for, reserved for them. We have pointed out the role of the Capellanus Cancellarius, who had supreme jurisdiction over canons and clergy, and the role uh, of the chantro, the, the, uh, I have already mentioned. When on January 6, 1922, the day of of Epiphania, Rolfin assisted at the Holy Mass in the Palatine Chapel. In his diary, he points out the lightning, which was not only achieved by candle, but by electric light too. Artificial light, as Rolfin calls it. He mentions brilliantly dressed canonici as a Protestant from a family originally from Winterthur near Zurich, he had probably not a large experience concerning the Catholic mass and were therefore astonished by the incensing of the canons. The embracing of each one of them was not performed by the deacon, as he writes, but by the archdeacon, as we may correct the ecclesiastical position of the protagonist of the scene. 
despite his astonishment, we suspect that Ralphine was not entirely new to the Catholic liturgy, as a passage in his diary suggests. Written some 30 years later, I quote, Paris, Christmas Day, 1888. Music in Saint-Eustache, sunshine between the strange pillars. I'm standing next to the high altar. What an extension of the soul when you leave, when the full breadth and depth of the central nave opens up to your gaze. The holy place must have been heavenly, a heavenly space for the people of the Middle Ages in their narrow streets, end of the quote. Did Welflin listen to music in Satustash or was he present at a mass celebration? We cannot judge from this passage. Both are possible. I come to my last chapter. Valflin's idea of pure seeing. What we read here in Valflin's diary on January 1922 is a moment of intense observation of mental immersion in the scene. It shows the art historian's attention even more clearly when he includes his subsequent comments on Goethe. His remarks on the Italian journey and the complaint about how much Goethe had left out, and it ends with the words, I quote, only the objective, the atmosphere, no associations. The inequality of the mentions is nevertheless strange. The Monreale Cappella Palatina non word, end of the quote. In this description of the Royal Chapel of Palermo, Belflin succeeds in recreating an atmosphere suggesting association that, however, are more to be guessed than revealed. But by practicing this intense scene, this emotion in the moment, the art historian put aside every aspect of the historical dimension of the scene. The fact that the building, the Palatine Chapel, the canons, as well as the liturgy, form an inseparable unity intended from its beginning in 1140 and wanted by Roger II. At the beginning of our presentation, we put a series of questions. The last one concerns Rolfling art historical methods. One of these was to jot down his ideas on sticky note and organize these various pieces of paper into thematically assembled fascicles. At the end, this resulted in an epistemology of Wolfling's horizon of knowledge, which allows us to go gain insight into the art historian's way of thinking. One of Wolfling's approaches to analyzing art was the idea of pure seeing. So he noted on a slip of paper, number one of the first fascicle, the central object, the seeable, new concepts of clarity, takes the picture purely into the soul, the real nature, Elimination of associations, poetic, not scientific, statistical game. Andreas I deserve credit for pointing out the close connection between Welfling's pure seeing and Goethe's word of ideas. On November 10th, 1786, during his Italian journey, Goethe noted in Rome, my practice of seeing and reading everything as it is, my faithfulness, letting my eyes be light, my complete renunciation of all presentation once again 
is to my advantage and secretly makes me extremely happy." End of the quote. This passage from the Italian journey was excerpted by Ralph Lynn, slightly shortened on a slip of paper in fascicle number two of his notes. In conclusion, the pure seeing by the art historian was an idea he had taken up by Goethe in his Italian journey and which became an important element of his art historical method. Assisting mass in the Palatine Chapel in Palermo was a moment of intense seeing, sort of immersion in the scene itself, as he says in his note on slip of paper number three in fascicle one. Take the picture purely into the south. I come to my conclusions. The theme of our workshop is modernity and the construction of sacred space. In our paper, we have examined the conditions under which Heinrich Welfins perceives sacred space, using the example of the Cappella Palatina, the Palatine Chapel. This example has shown, them, shown us his perception is subject to conditions formulated by the art historian himself, either in his writing or in his sticky notes. Even without historical knowledge, the Swiss art historian perceived sacred space together with the liturgy and its actors as a whole, and this thanks to his pure seeing. I thank you for your kind attention.